Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Tanya, for inviting me to, to come along today. I've been involved with wildlife for about 35 years. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief history of what our network is and then go from there. So as Tanya mentioned, um, we were very fortunate to have many inspired people involved in our formation, which was in 2007. We were a small group of wildlife shelters, carers and rescuers, um, and we would here to, as a means to support and communicate for wildlife volunteers and also um, in, the, in the wildlife area of Masson Ranges. Sorry, I'm very nervous. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. The Masson Ranges Wildlife Network grew and evolved beyond just supporting and working with those active in wildlife care and rescue, to be an active, well-received, credible voice in the community about wildlife. Okay, as a group of wildlife volunteers, we established something called WAM, Wildlife Awareness Month, which we used to hold every October. We used to have awareness meetings. We had talks in schools. We did talks in libraries. Uh, we held events at markets for anybody that wanted to talk about wildlife, wanted to know about species, anything. Our volunteers would be there and do the best we could to try and help. We had a great relationship with the council and also with the local media. So, you know, if we had stories to tell or even if it was just information, they would welcome our, our thoughts and we could get it out there. Um, we also produce regular articles on living with wildlife and that type of thing. Just grassroots stuff, but it was all you needed to talk about. Okay, so in 2014, we became incorporated. We had a couple of busy years. We did a lot of fire search and rescue. There wasn't a lot around at that stage doing wildlife, and our communities care about wildlife. We liaised, we did things properly, we liaised with CFA, incidents controllers, with the council and also landholders. We organised letter drops to affected private properties with contact details on who to contact for wildlife. So anybody that saw anything, they knew where to go. If they had concerns on their property, they had somebody to call. Okay, so we were heavily involved in... in Fireground searches at the Black Range Kerry Heskett fires in 2013, the Dalrymple Road, Riddles Creek fires of 2014, Bald Hill 2015, and then the infamous Lansfield Cobor fire of 2015. With that, we liaised with Dalwip at the time because it was um, not private property, the bulk of the searches, we did it the correct way. So we coordinated rescues, gathered rescuers from other areas, not just mass and rangers to actually help, and did a lot of walkthroughs with that particular one. We also do occasional walkthroughs through prescribed burns once they're declared safe. And all of this is looking for displaced wildlife, injured wildlife, or anything like that. Okay. Cool. Now, I was asked to talk about how we relate to council and what information we can spread and help and just start networking again with any organisation, people that are interested about wildlife in our shire. Okay, so in, in working with the council in early days, we, we were invited to speak after the fires Regarding the Masson Range, uh, the Municipal Emergency Plan, we did have input in the Municipal Recovery Animal and Stock Welfare Subplan, so we were involved in all that. I think a lot of that's now changed, but we were in there. We participated in the fire recoveries um, meetings, particularly after the Lancefield one, 
people did care about their wildlife. So with council's help, we put a lot of signage up, warning of displaced wildlife on the roads. And again, keeping the number out there for anybody that wanted to help. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we, we also participated in council community wildlife talks and shared many of their environmental and social media things on our platforms as well, so it worked really well. Um, we also helped instigate the signage on Ashbourne Road, which is to create a, a wildlife trial, which worked really well at the time. It's sort of in a little bit of a, a disrepair. I don't know how many of you know that, but we actually put zebra stripes on the road to actually get people to sort of stop, read the sign and slow down. It worked very well until the new metal road armour core, what's it called, was put on and unfortunately that started channeling the wildlife into the area so it became a little bit more of a problem. Okay, so getting back to the topic of this forum, many of our members are at the coal face of Wildlife Road Tour. Toll. They are the wildlife rescuers, the volunteers who see the carnage day in, day out. They are unpaid and at times underappreciated. Few who go out to the roadside in oh, sorry. They are underpaid and at times unappreciated. The unappreciated few who go out to roadside instance rescuing what can be saved and dealing with what can't be. Many attend multiple rescues a day as WV callouts or as all were private ones. So as you would have seen from the figures, that's a lot of people to go out. And these, as they mentioned, are local unpaid volunteers who give up their time and it is heartbreaking for them. Okay. We all know that there's not one single solution there are many views on how mitigation, mitigation of the wildlife road toll, as previously discussed. There are road designs, road speed signage, driver awareness. This is a huge problem that we cannot solve just by one organisation or one group. It takes a whole lot, but we all must work together, listen and learn. From a wildlife perspective, I believe education is crucial. The car's the weapon. Target the driver. Find better ways to educate, create driver awareness. I'm a firm believer that we need to advocate driver awareness in the learner books. Teach them from the very beginning to drive with wildlife. Have information available for residents to change their driving habits when they start moving into rural areas. Driving with wildlife in Melbourne is different from driving in wildlife on country roads. So learn to deal with it. Um, okay. Each area has totally different wildlife risks. Different roads in the Shire have different road like things. It's not all macropods. So in dealing with roads or how we want to affect speeds, it's so important to speak to Wildlife Victoria and on a local thing, speak to your wildlife rescuers. They know, they've been there, they know the different variations in roads and how it affects wildlife. Thank you.